Is that? No. Hello, good afternoon everyone. My name is Hugh Constant. I am a practice development manager here at the Social Care Institute for Excellence and I really like, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar. This is the fourth of six webinars in a series that Sky is running on behalf of the Better Care Support Team as part of their drive to improve integrated health and social care. I will apologise at the beginning, uh, we're sitting in an office in Baker Street in London and outside someone is digging up Baker Street um, quite noisily, so I, I think it should be okay but apologies if you can hear a faint sort of drumming in the background. Um, as I say, this is the fourth of six webinars. Um, can I just uh, draw your attention? We have one on Thursday on integrated workforce and one on the 27th of June on metrics and evaluation. And you can find details of those on our website. But for today, I'm delighted to welcome um, Andy Clayton, who is Head of Health Informatics for both Doncaster and Rotherham CCGs, and Sue Meakin, who is the Head of Information and Data Protection Officer for the Rotherham, Doncaster and South Humber NHS Foundation Trust. Um, they are going to talk about information governance and data sharing. Um, I was lucky enough to hear them talk about this at a recent national workshop that we ran and it is a really insightful and helpful take on what is a tricky topic about how you can best share information um, and with whom about patients um, and yeah, how, how that can work in the patient's best interest. The webinar is going to last for about an hour. Um, you will see um, Andy and Sue will take you through a series of questions as they go for you to answer. But if you want to ask questions, and we really encourage you to do so, then the chat box, which many of you have already found in the kind of middle of your screens, if you write your questions there, I will keep an eye out for those and I will put those questions to Andy and Sue at the end of the webinar. Okay? Um, so that's it for me. I'm now going to hand you over to Andy and Sue um, to take you through the session. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Andy Clayton speaking. Uh, as you said, I'm Head of Health Informatics at Doncaster and Rotherham CCGs. Um, we're going to take you through a quick slideshow this morning that demonstrates the approach we've taken to developing a new integrated care record system for Doncaster. Um, that system's actually gone live today, so it's a big day for us. This has been about an 18-month process. Oh, sorry, missed our intro slide there. <laughs> Moving quickly on, um, slide on the screen there just gives you a little bit of background to Doncaster. Um, I think probably the key thing to say to Don about Doncaster is we're perceived to be a relatively straightforward community for integration projects because we've got coterminous boundaries and, prime, and, and singular primary providers. So we have one acute provider, um, we've got one joint mental health and community service provider, we've got a single CCG and we've got a single local authority. So we have got a very nice fit. Um, and in terms of how we manage ourselves together, the public sector bodies in Doncaster collectively refer themselves to, as Team Doncaster, um, and they've developed uh, a Doncaster-wide strategy called the Doncaster Growing Together Plan. That's four areas about Doncaster learning together, working together, living together, and caring together. And the Integrated Care Record Programme has come together as part of that, care record, that caring strategy. So I'm just going to talk you through briefly about how we actually identified why we needed an Integrated Care Record System. The slide on the screen now gives you a position where we were in June 2016. Um, Doncaster developed its local digital roadmap between sort of January 2016 and June 2016. Over that six months, all the partners were working together to identify a baseline for where we were in terms of our, our information sharing and informatics services. And what we, what, we, what we identified, we didn't need to document this really to identify it, but it did bring it home, was that at that stage, we weren't really sharing any much information across the community. And we weren't really engaged with much uh, with each other very much either. And there wasn't a lot of integration work or sharing being, being taken forwards. But what we recognised in terms of the supporting factors was that we got really strong support from our organisational leaders to do something. Um, I think as, a, as a, a bunch of informatics professionals, we recognised together that we needed to work more closely together and start to integrate systems and services. Um, we got an open and honest approach that we found from when we did our local digital roadmap. We were willing to share where we were at and where we thought we needed to go. Um, and we've got the last bullet point, which is slightly, slightly a joke, but we had a very low baseline, so anything we did could only be a significant improvement on what we were doing. Um, so with that in mind, we set forward a vision statement that you can see there at the bottom. And that was broadly that we wanted to integrate data across our systems and pathways um, and, and across providers. 
But at that point, we still needed to identify what we wanted, where we were going to start, and we still needed to identify how we were going to do it. We didn't have any platform or incumbent systems, so we needed to work out how we were going to approach this problem. We've put questions throughout this, uh, throughout this presentation. This first one, just to get you thinking, is how have you actually approached your identification of the need for a shared care record system? It'd be great if you could all just indicate there where, what state you're currently in. Great, so there's some interesting results coming up there. Just under 20% of you have not started. The rest of you are at some stage on, along the way. 5% of you have actually completed, so congratulations to you that have completed it. Um, right, so just talking about how we scoped a care record. As I say, we knew we wanted to share information, but we didn't actually know what we were going to start with. And we had some fairly difficult tentative discussions regarding what the initial scopes could be when we started this. Um, questions we were considering were what system should we include, what data set should we include, what services should take a priority for integrated care, for integrated care records. Um, and we didn't know quite where we were going to go. But fortunately, um, at the time we were having these discussions, there was also ongoing in Doncaster an intermediate care transformation programme. And they were developing a case for change for, for rationalising intermediate care pathways at that point. One of the things they identified in their case for change, you can see the page up there on the slide, is that they felt that there was a need um, to integrate information more broadly and to have a single IT system across Doncaster. Um, now you can imagine that many IT colleagues reacted in horror to the proposal that we'd have a single IT system across all systems and services, but what it did make us realise was that we needed to integrate that information more broadly across there. Um, issues that they were finding on the intermediate care was that information was stored in many different systems, they found that the information was not being shared at all, there was a lot of duplication across systems, and they recognised that it was also causing inefficiencies in delivery. Um, so we agreed to work with the Intermediate Care Transformation Programme to support information sharing for their rapid response pathway. Um, this was chosen as a pathway because it had already been reviewed and it had already been transformed, so we weren't, wasn't trying to impose a new digital solution on an old pathway. This was a pathway that was ripe for that transformation and having that digital service overlay. Second question, have you identified priority pathways for your shared care records? So those results there are quite in keeping with what we found in Doncaster. It's quite difficult to identify what your priority is going to be. Um, great if you can identify a pathway that's, that's, that's ready and willing to work with you on this. This has been really beneficial to the process in Doncaster. So if I just move us on to the next slide. Just talk about how we specified and procured our system. Um, before we actually went out to procurement, we looked at what we could do locally and we worked with one of our providers to see if we could develop a local system. We had to go out doing an e-form solution, um, but we found that progress was, was slow and much slower than what we needed to be. So we got to December 2016 and we decided we were going to hold a market engagement process um, where we got all of the key integrated care record system suppliers in a room and let them give a brief presentation based on a scenario we'd given them, just giving us an idea of what was available on the market and how we might take this forward. Um, and that was a really successful day, and so following that, in January 2007, we decided we were going to procure a solution as a proof of concept. So, in January 2007, we engaged some consultants and said, how are we going to specify this system? Um, and we moved to a series of workshops in February 2017. We, because we were working with the Intermediate Care Pathway team, we decided we were going to take a very much bottom-up approach. So we started with the, the clinicians and carers working in the intermediate care pathway. 
We held two workshop sessions with them, um, and they were blue sky thinking sessions. Team members were told to tell us what they wanted from the from a shared care record solution. There were no there were no limitations or restrictions. They could tell us exactly what they wanted, um, and they were great sessions. They had loads and loads of enthusiasm. They were well attended, and lots of ideas were generated. The, the two photos on the slide that you can see are just some of the, how we collected the information. You can see post-its flowing off the page. We were getting really really lots of ideas being generated, um, and so we took all all that information that we got from the clinicians and we developed it into a coherent vision statement for what we wanted from the integrated care record system. Next slide gives you an idea of the whole process that we followed. Um, so after we'd got the requirements from the, from the uh, clinicians, we went on and held a second workshop with information governance leads. We wanted to put before the information and governance leads what the requirements had come up with from the clinicians to say, is this possible? Do we think this is feasible? Will it be legal? Will it be permissible? Um, and it, again, the information governance leads were really, really well engaged. Um, they responded to what we were asking to them, and they set about developing a uh, privacy impact assessment so, so, we, so we could manage this process. And that's been a dynamic document that we've developed and held throughout this process, and it's been received and agreed by all organisations. Um, after we'd met with the information governance leads, we finally met with the, with the technical leads. And our, we, our position to the technical leads was, we, we know what the users want to do, we understand from the information governance leads what's, what's possible, Technically, what do you see as the limitations um, and, and opportunities that we can do with this solution? And again, we've got all the, all the technical leads on board. We also held a number of one-to-one -one workshops um, with senior executives, so we got their input into it. And then once we got all that information together, we, we developed a specification. Um, we also analysed all our key documentation, so we analysed the document, uh, the Doncaster Place Plan. We analysed the Doncaster Local Digital Roadmap. And using all that information, we put together a coherent spec for our, for our procurement exercise. Um, we then put that back to all the partner organisations and validated it, so everyone signed off on the spec before it went out to market. And then finally, we went out to the market. Um, we chose the NHS London Procurement Partnership as our framework for making this procurement. We chose that predominantly because that adopted some of the key suppliers that we'd seen in our earlier market engagement session. Um, it had all the key ones on there that we thought we might want to, to show interest in this. We went out to market. Um, we got a response from six suppliers. All the key, all the key IDCR uh, players were there and responded. And at the end of March, we made a selection um, of Orion Healthcare as our integrated care record solution provider. We made the decision in March, but actually managing the contract point, it was July 2017 before we put pen to paper and signed the contract with them for the for the system. Just to give you a quick idea of what we'd actually bought, the slide there shows you what we went for in Doncaster. So our integrated care record system put, brings together um, five key local systems. From acute care, it brings together the, um, the A&E system, Symphony, and the patient administration system, which is CAMIS. From our community provider, it's system one. From our out of hours provider, it's the Adastra system. And from our local authority, it's the Care First system. And then it also brings together all of the 40 GP practices in Doncaster who are on a collection of System 1 and EMIS Web um, and their information is brought into the IDCR via the Medical Interoperability Gateway, the MIG that many of you may know of. In terms of setting the expectations for a pilot, I said that when we met with the clinicians, um, we just gave them blue sky thinking and told them to you know, be brave and tell us exactly what you'd want from this system. We had to recognise that as a pilot, we wouldn't be able to do everything at once. So this is this is broadly what our expectations were for the for the pilot stage of the integrated care record. First, we wanted timely sharing of uh, <coughs> timely sharing and of accurate health and care information. We think the integrated care record can do that. We want a solution that interfaces with all the systems in Doncaster. Well, it won't affect, interface with them all immediately, but it integrates with probably the five key ones that we've already got, and it's got the capability to integrate with many more besides that. If we move on this to the next stage. We wanted to reduce the, um, the paper-based activities which, and ultimately eliminate them, and that will certainly help us to do this. We wanted access to the IDCR from any location, and again, this is a web-based solution, so we can do that, and it's also available on smartphones and tablets, so it'll, it'll, it'll work anywhere. Um, we'd been asked to try and develop a shared care assessment that, that would move with the patient, and we actually recognise that for the pilot, that's a step too far. So whilst the system we bought does have the capability to do that, that's not within the pilot phase. 
and also with the clinicians had asked us for the option for patients and carers to be able to access the record. Again, the solution we've bought does have that capability, but it's not within the pilot system that we've bought. But should we, should we move on through the pilot stage, it's something we can expand to. Third question, can you have a consideration of what's the scope of your shared care record? Thanks for that. Yeah, as you'd expect, a slight majority looking at health and social care, um, but a good number of you as well also wanting to introduce the third sector, which is something that we've considered as well. It's not within the scope of our proof of concept, but it's something that we would hope to do in a, in a further phase of this project. So just going to give you a couple of slides on the implementation stage. On screen now, there's a copy of the governance structure that we put together in Doncaster to manage the, uh, the develop, del delivery of our integrated care record solution. Um, it took us a while to come up with this. It took a bit of refinement. But what we've got there now is we've got a core integrated care record project team that's got lead officers from all of the partner organisations. Those leads were, were, were asked to be key individuals who could hold the ring on activities across their organisation, and that's worked quite well for us. That reports up to Doncaster's Interoperability Group, which is effectively our multi-agency group for managing our digital agenda. Um, but it's also been reporting into the Intermediate Care, Health and Social Care Programme, which is the, the, the partner pathway that we've been working with. Um, and above all that, we've been reporting indirectly into our Integrated Care Partnership Leadership Team, um, which is effectively a chief executive group. So they've been taking regular updates on where we've been in the delivery of this system. And then below that in the bottom layer, we just set up a number of substreams, um, some of which are specialist streams, such as information governance and the technical work stream, some of which have been very much user-led streams, such as benefits analysis and configuration, and some of, which, some of which have been a mixture, like the testing, which has been both a technical and a user-led stream. But we've had those, those streams have been effectively small task and finish groups, again, with, with representatives from across all partner organisations. Question we'd like you to consider, are all the partners in your shared care record fully committed and engaged to a programme? Yeah, those findings coming out there strongly identifying that some partners are engaged, not necessarily all of them yet. And I think that's fairly consistent with the experience we've had in Doncaster, um, which I'll talk about within the next slide on our enablers. So just to give you an idea of what I consider to be some of the key enablers and key barriers to delivery of our integrated care record system. Um, top one there, on the left-hand side, the full engagement of clinicians and managers from the Intermediate Care Programme team. Um, I think the clinical commitment to this has been absolutely key and, and they have been the driver for it. Um, without them, I don't think we'd have got to where we are. Um, I certainly wouldn't have done it as quickly and I'm not sure if we'd have actually even been able to deliver one full stop. The support of the executive leadership has been incredibly beneficial. Um, again, key to, key to have. We've had money available from the Better Care Fund, which has been really useful as a war chest for delivering this. Um, we anticipated that actually procuring the system would, you know, would be costly. One of the things that we didn't anticipate as much would be the cost that we need to, with providers in terms of them supporting their integration activities. Um, and having that money available from the Better Care Fund and being able to support those activities has kind of kept the wheels on the bus and kept things moving swiftly at pace for us. Um, also, we got the LMC, the Doncaster LMC, to support the system. And their endorsement has been really key to getting GPs signed up to using the system. Um, with their support, we've actually got 100% engagement. All of the practices in Doncaster are signed up to the system and contributing data which is, uh, is, is great. We didn't expect to get 100%, so we're really pleased that we managed to achieve that. Some of the barriers that we've had, um, we've got there the engagement of the partner IT departments. Um, I'd say we, we, we had senior buy-in, and we probably had senior informatics buy-in as well in terms of the chief informatics officer signed up to it. But I don't think that message necessarily devolved fully through to the IT departments and some of our partners. 
Um, and the response was really is that in some cases, certainly early days, they weren't treating it as a priority. Um, they are small, many, in many cases, small departments. They're strapped for resources, both time and money. And it was a fairly, uh, it was fairly fair reaction on their part that it hadn't been given to them as a priority and therefore it wasn't being treated as one. But that took us some, uh, some time to get, to get resolved. Um, system provider support was difficult. Even, even as I say, we had BCF money to fund some of the uh, system providers to help us integrate their systems. But they weren't necessarily responsive. Um, so that took some getting some time to resolve. The lack of a pre-agreed information governance framework held us up at the beginning. Um, with hindsight, if we'd, if we'd started working on our information governance approach right at the beginning when we started the procurement, that would have allowed us in the earlier stages to move quickly because we needed the information sharing agreement signed and ready to go. Um, and resources, as I say, particularly um, the time and, and, and individuals as much as money. Um, you are you do put a great, quite a great big expectation on your partner organisations when you're doing one of these projects. So making sure that they've got the resources available and aligned and they're treated as a priority is key to being able to move this forward. Um, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Sue Meakin, who's going to talk you through the information governance approach that we've got about with this, this care record programme. Oh, sorry, one quick question before we move on. What do you think might be the key barrier to successful implementation of a shared care record in your locality? All of the above coming out there at seventy yeah. percent, which I, I think I'd agree with. You, you, um, what some may have stronger stronger elements than others, you need to reflect on all of them. They uh, they all need to be taken in consideration, and you need to have a plan to manage them all. So, okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Obviously, information governance, as on the previous questions, can be seen to be a bit of a, a blocker or a barrier. But from our expectations as IG leads, what we need to be done is to be involved at the start of the project, users as enablers and not blockers. Sometimes that's hard, but I think with the culture that we're now developing with the introduction of the GDPR and the new Data Protection Act 2018, that we actually expect to be used, if we can use that term, at the beginning of our or any project that are being run. So firstly, to kick off, um, question for everybody. Have you identified the IG leads from partners and engaged them in data sharing developments? So what we can see there's quite a mixed mixed reaction. We know that some um, organisations struggle with obviously IG representation. Not everybody's got an identified IG uh, support within organisations. So moving on, the, the whole emphasis around um, engaging with your IG leads is to ensure that the documentation is in place um, that it's living documentation throughout the, the life of the project and obviously as we know the GDPR kicked in 25th of May and one of the key documents that all um, organisations should be producing now are data protection and impact assessments. If anything goes wrong it's the first thing that the ICO will ask to see and obviously um, a data protection impact assessment is a privacy risk mitigation tool it helps to identify risks associated with the project and how we're going to overcome those risks. Um, the Information Commissioner, uh, like we said, are very keen on these and now within the GDPR it's something that has to be done. They are mandatory. Um, your data protection impact assessment should cover all partners 
and all partners should be signed up to the project and um, agreeing the data protection impact assessments. The DPIA, in short, will be a living document throughout the life of the project requiring periodic review. We know that projects shift and change, risks are identified as you're going through. These all need to be identified and documented within the, the um, PIA or DPIA as some organisations call them just to keep it up to date. They also need to be um, put out into the public domain with privacy notices, your sharing agreement, so the public are fully aware of what uh, projects are taking place. We know DPIA is now, uh, GDPR is now in, um, so I would hope that organisations have policies and procedures that are being followed to make sure that these are taking place. So, another quick question. What is the status of your DPIA for shared care records? Yep. I mean, obviously, the not started could be the fact that it's still in consideration, or it could be, I know that some projects, it's still deciding who's actually going to undertake the, the DPIA. Uh, sometimes it's, it's very hard to identify that one individual to actually take it forward. So, something else for you to consider as part of the project is what kind of consent model um, are you going to use? Um, there are numbers of projects around the country all using slightly different consent models, which once again is quite confusing. The consent model we chose to use um, is obviously one that is uh, prescribed by the system itself. Um, it's a two-tier consent model. So the first tier is that consent is implied to create a record within the system. The second tier is then it's explicit consent to view a record. So at the time of the patient being with a healthcare professional, they are asked if they are happy for that record to be shared. So it, it is two tier and we know that some projects around the country have just gone for an implied consent using a legal basis to do so. Obviously, if you are using a consent model, you have to then build in an opt out model uh, for the IDCR, we have a cent central process where the public can express their wishes to be opted out of the IDCR. Um, uh, it's, it's something that has to be done. It's about the data subjects' rights. Um, and we haven't had that many opt-outs, around about 16. So it's, it's really good, but it's all about making sure that you have got a really good comms uh, program in place. So obviously because we went down the implied and explicit consent, if you are using the implied consent, you have to identify your legal basis. And obviously the legal basis being that it's for direct care. And within the GDPR and the New Data Protection Act 2018, there is an explicit um, section on using data for direct health and social care. So they've included social care as well now. Your communications, like I've said, are such a big thing. Uh, we've done the privacy notices, which obviously now under GDPR we have to have. Posters, leaflets, local papers, radio. If anything goes wrong, the ICO will need to um, come in and they'll want to be assured that we have um, tried to achieve um, and taken proportionate effort of targeting a high percentage of the population. It's very hard to do that because we know that the population shifts and changes and it's about that ongoing communication plan. So information sharing agreements, we know we spoke about this and this is something that we really should have thought about getting in as soon as possible. Um, information sharing agreements or ISAs are not legally binding documents. However, the Information Commissioner's Office do recognise them as good practice. But it is also good practice because it's, it makes it very clear what organisations are, are signing up to. 
They should document the legal basis for the information sharing, what information will be shared within the IDCR, the organisations that are party to the sharing, and then also it helps us to be able to identify what we need to tell patients or the data subjects about the data sharing and how we will communicate that information. It identifies the measures we have put in place to ensure adequate security is in place to protect the data. The ISA was signed up by all partners before any information was flowed into the IDCR. Partners have to be comfortable and assured that we are working within the law. So question eight, does your area have established sharing agreements to support a shared care record? Okay. So quite a number of you that obviously have them, a few that obviously don't know. These, these are quite key. I think it sets out quite clearly what is required of partners. And also then it can be reflected within your data protection impact assessments. So something else to consider, your patient cohort. Looking at the geographical boundaries of Doncaster, something we had to consider was the cohort of patient, especially when you looked at cross boundaries and cross borders. Um, so one of the options we had to consider was leaving the patient cohort un unrestricted and accept the IG risks. Or option two, the patient cohort will be restricted at, at, as described above, but by GP practice. Um, what we had to do really then is to look at not just the IG risk, but to trump it with clinical risk. Um, we have a number of patients that maybe are seen by GPs outside the area or within the area, and it's about making sure that we can capture the biggest amount of population to ensure that there is no clinical risk there. And then make sure that the comms are pushed out far enough so people can then make the choice of whether they want an IDCR record or not. Um, it, it, it's, it's just something to consider. Um, it gets very confusing, but it's at the end of the day, it's the consideration to clinical risk. So role-based access controls. When you are looking at any integrated care system, you will get a variety of different levels of professionals accessing your system. And the one thing that you will need to consider is role-based access controls, making sure that staff have the um, access to the records of the level that they are required to do so. What we have to do is obviously, once again, you document it within your ISA, your privacy impact assessment, making sure that your cohort of staff have access to the correct level of um, records that they need. These were then agreed by senior governance. But also on top of that, you need to be able to audit, obviously, activity within records to make sure that, you know, staff are respecting records that they're being given access to. So then moving back to Andy, who's going to now talk about benefits. Yeah, just a quick couple of slides to conclude. Um, obviously, we spent a lot of time, energy and money on this system, so we want to make sure that we do get the best out of it. So we put a formal benefits programme in place. Um, slide up there, the, the, the bubbles just give you a, a few indications of some of the key benefits that people have been identifying for us, and we, we've developed those uh, six benefit categories that we're looking for benefits within. Um, we're managing this program through our, through our consultant partners. They're working actively with our users and service managers to, to, as, a, as an ongoing process. We started it well before, right in the early stages of implementation, and it's going to go on for the next few months. Um, the outcome of it hopefully will help to inform our future roadmap and a business case for further development of this system. We've currently got the system contracted up until August 2019, so we need to identify how we take it forward from there. 
Um, we're getting lots of benefits identified by staff. Again, the, the sessions that we've been holding with users when we're showing them the system are really enthusiastic. Um, we've had reports of people whooping with joy when they see some of the information, particularly out of our services. They've been delighted to see the extended data set that they're now going to get access to. So it's been a really positive experience. Um, and just to show you the journey that we're going on, on the final slide. Um, that, that's our benefits journey as we anticipate it to be. So the left-hand box there is a case of the, the, obviously the intermediate care program team had rationalised their pathway and immediately started to uh, reap some benefits from that. Then we introduced the integrated care record system, which is that read-only system and that initial second tier of benefits that we expect to achieve. And then moving on into that third column, there's a set of benefits there that we hope in the future as the system develops and uptake increases that we'll be able to deliver. So that concludes our presentation. Um, I believe we're able to take questions via the web chat for anybody. Um, and all remains to say thank you for listening to us this afternoon and we'll take any questions. Oh, we've, sorry, we have got one more question before we conclude. Um, yeah, on the benefits. So where would you perceive that your shared care record will deliver its most benefits for you? Yeah, some quite even scores coming out there. And again, it, hopefully, um, integrated care record systems will, will impact on all of those factors. One probably not to be un underestimated from the feedback we're getting is the clinical safety element, as I say, with the, particularly the out-of-hours service from the limited data set that they currently treat patients with to what they can see now is, um, is a massive improvement. So, thank you all very much. And any questions? Um, yeah, Andy, so thank you very much for that. I love the idea that when it comes to information um, governance and data sharing that people are whooping. Um, it's not normally something you associate with whooping, but um, it's, it's, it's really a clear sign of how, of how you know, well thought through this, is, this has been done. Um, so the question started to come through. A uh, question from Claudia that people can see. And yeah, this is an interesting one. I remember this being raised when, we, uh, when you did this at the workshop. So you're covering the geographical area, but how do you deal with a situation where the parent is ordinarily resident in one area, and so gets their social care in that area, and that's outside the scope, but their GP is inside the scope? Yeah. So obviously if the GP's in scope, then the data obviously will be fed through from the MIG, uh, from a GP's point of view. What's the MIG? The Medical Interoperability Gateway. Um, a third party portal that we use for getting the GP data into the system. Okay. However, obviously, if the, the social care provider is outside of the remit of the of the project, then that won't be fed through because obviously that would sit within a, within another area. However, moving forward, there are talk about widening projects. I know we've we've spoken in the past. So although at the moment some projects are bound within boundaries of let's say the Doncaster project who's to say what's going to happen in the next 12 18 months um, as we broaden the horizon and have ICS size patches mm -hmm. um, so obviously if answering that question you'd, you'd, you'd all you'd pull in from that would be the GP data and any data if they've been within the acute trust within our area yeah no, I think to add to that Sue's answer is right. In that case, it would just be currently the GP data. Um, but we're, we're part of Yorkshire and Humber, and we're already talking about federating with other Yorkshire and Humber integrated care record systems, governments permitting, um, so we can start to broaden out that boundary. We're already exploring a dialogue with a neighbour, so with Rotherham CCG, where there's a separate uh, shared care record platform, we're talking about doing a tentative in, uh, investigation of how we could link those together. And Neil's question, is the clinical portal embedded within partner native applications or is it a separate app with separate logins? It's a mixture of both. Um, where we can integrate it with partner applications we do. So for example with the GP systems, um, EMIS Web have got a, a, a context link. So from within EMIS Web you can open the integrated care record system without another login. Um, it will take you straight through. It's in context. It will open inside that record. 
Whereas with system one, they don't have that functionality. So they do have to open it separately and have a separate login. So I think the answer is wherever we can get um, context login direct through from a native application, we do. Um, and where not, then it is a, it's a separate login. And Anas has asked a question, and I want, Anas, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to add a, a slight question of my own onto it. So is this model applicable to more complex areas with different providers for each aspect of care? And also, yeah, <coughs> I mean, you, you mentioned at the beginning that you are conveniently coterminous. Um, is there any tips for areas where, it, where it's not and you have to work across more boundaries? You it's probably a, didn't need to think about a, it because you, you are. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not a problem we've been faced with, but but I mean, Doncaster is a fairly small town. A lot of uh, a lot of our provision is done in Sheffield, um, so we've got patients flying across those boundaries into Sheffield, um, and it's one of the things that we took into consideration as part of our actual procurement. So Sheffield is another another Orion customer. They're actually on the same platform within Sheffield Teaching Hospital. So we're starting to think about that. I think it's really thinking about what what's in your neighbouring areas how you might start to federate with them in the future and having that one one eye on that as you do your procurement. In terms of more complex um, more complex environments, I think most environments probably will be more complex than us. Um, the idea is to, to, to start with something that's manageable and build up would be my recommendation. We've got a small number of partners and those nice one-to-one -one relationships and even working in our environment has been difficult. Um, so I'd work with something manageable, that would be my recommendation. And there's a sort of related question, I suppose, from Nick here, who works for a charity. Do, do the organisations that you commission, do they have to add their data to the system? Because it, it doesn't include the third sector yet, so what, what, what's the you know, role of third sector information? I think that's in future scope for us. Um, we always anticipated that there would be other agencies to add onto this integrated care record system as it, as it matures. Um, but going back to the earlier question, it's about having a manageable scope. A manageable scope, we were working with a single pathway We've joined together information that supports that pathway from the partners, from the key providers. Um, so, for example, uh, children's services in Doncaster are currently outside of scope. We we'll anticipate that they would be in the next iteration. And as we move to wider pathways where the third sector engage, we would bring them into it. Um, and yeah, we, we ask when partners sign up that they become both a provider and a consumer. And you can be a bit of either or, but ideally you would be using the system and providing data into it. And Rosie asks, do the social care staff have access to view clinical data such as the MIG? And our data is different for professional staff. There's something about role-based access. Yeah, so I'll let Sue answer. Go on, go on. Yes, the answer so, is yes. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah, the answer is yes. Obviously, when we've talked about role-based access, so obviously different professionals will have different access to certain levels of data. Um, but whether it's social care, whether it's health from the different providers, they will have access to the MIG. So the social, the yeah. social care data can see, yes. see elements yeah. of the GP data. Yeah, as long as they're qualified professionals. Yeah. Oh, here's an interesting one. Is there another one for Is there any safeguarding that this information is not provided to private health insurance? How do you make sure that? This system is purely for direct care. Um, the only people that have got logins to it, other than the system administrators, are our care professionals and their supporters. Um, so no, we, we, there's no extract from it. It's not a management information system. We're not doing any population health planning on this. This is purely to support care for direct care. Um, no data will be extracted or sold to anybody from it. Um, so I'll skip to Colin's question then, because he's talking about extractable data as well. Do you anticipate that data will be extractable from the system in the future to add to patient care plans, different sort of extractable data? Um, yeah, I think we would aspire to do that in the future, um, government, government's permitting. Um, there's the whole question of how we develop it. It's currently only a read-only read system. We've certainly got users and services that, would, that have already seen it that are saying this would be brilliant if it could, we could write into it as well and, and have shared care planning within it or extract data into our systems. Um, it's early days for us because we've only recently gone live, so it depends on how it will develop. But yeah, I think that's an aspiration that we would like to see. And Marion was asking, how long did it take to get the IS, ISA signed off with partners? It was actually quite smooth running, but I think that's mainly because we'd already had the interaction of the IG leads and we'd already started work on the privacy impact assessment. So discussions had already taken place. Um, as IG leads, most had access to their Caldicott Guardian. There was plenty of comms going backwards and forwards within the organisation. But I think for any ISA, you have to give yourself a good month, two months, if you are going to start it from fresh. 
to make sure then that it's bouncing through the internal committees within each, within each of the organisations. Some take longer than others. Um, it just depends of the, the reporting mechanism within organisation. One of our partners, it, it took considerably longer because their, their IG group only met once every two months. So you were waiting for it to go through the, the mechanism to get signed off. So really, it does depend on, the, on your partner's capability. I think it took us about three months from start to yes. finish. We started drafting the actual documentation at the beginning of August. Sue and I again used the executive group for that one. We, we went to the executive group as, with an early draft, uh, probably beginning of September last year, and brought it to the exec's attention and said, you know, you need to get this signed up as quickly as possible. No data can flow until it's signed. Therefore, this is key to getting started. Um, and with their support, it did actually go through the governance quite quickly. Um, we put an aspirational date of having them all signed for the end of September, and I think we've probably actually got them all back for the end of October. So yeah, three month process, but definitely yeah. use your key Keep leaders it. if you've got their support to help that get driven through. Um, Lorraine has asked, can people go back in and change any information? No, read-only system. It, it's purely just displaying information from other care record systems. There's nothing that can be changed at this stage. Um, can I use chair's privilege and ask a couple? Um, so you mentioned GDPR, obviously, yes. which has been very topical. You also mentioned the Data Protection Act 2018, which yes. I personally haven't heard of. Is, is, this, is this going to change rules again? So Am I going to get a whole load more emails from people? Um, no. I bought stuff like 17 <laughs> years ago. Um, so what the Data Protection Act 2018 is, it's, it's to bring the old Data Protection Act up to date. And what you have to do is, the regulation is the General Data Protection Regulation. The Data Protection Act 2018 is the derogations that you have to read together with the GDPR. Okay. So the Data Protection Act 2018 is for the UK, so it fills the gaps of the General Data Protection Regulation right. and makes it relevant to the UK. So you have to read them together. Um, it's not a very nice read the new act, um, but obviously within there it does make it quite clear that for direct health and social care there is a legal basis now to share information, you don't have to rely on consent. Um, if you can find a legal basis, then you do that. What the Information Commissioner's Office is saying, and obviously under GDPR, is move away from obviously trying to obtain consent and use your legal basis. Okay. Um, Violet has asked, are you looking at spreading this to neighbouring regions? I don't know how much scope you have. For you. And Doncaster is part of the South Yorkshire and Bassett Law Integrated Care System, which has a digital work stream within it, um, which Sue and I are active participants. So people in South Yorkshire and Bassett Law are aware of what we've done. Um, so it's not the only integrated care record system inside that patch. Rotherham have a bespoke one um, that they developed a few years ago. Um, Sheffield have some of the Orion technology in there, so we're considering it as an ICS. Um, certainly we're, we're happy to share the learning both inside our own neighbouring regions or wider as required. Um, can I, because can I, you, you talked about consent, which obviously brings into question mental capacity. How, yes. how is that factored in? Are people kind of geared up for kind of assessing people's capacity to consent to sharing this information? I think that nothing really changes to how it, it should be done now. Obviously, I'm from the mental health community side, so obviously it's, it's embedded into what we do about, obviously, mental capacity. Um, so... If it's the GP, then the GP should be obviously having those discussions, um, should be monitoring the same as anywhere else. But obviously we've got mental capacity, but then you've got the balance then of obviously safeguarding and patients' best interests. And that can be documented within the, the record yeah. itself. So there is a balance. Um, mental capacity acts not changed. We still need to be considering that. But yeah. there is safeguarding and best interest to take into consideration. Um, I think as um, the, the questions are beginning to slow down, in, um, oh no, let's see now, at the moment I said that, people have started typing. <laughs> um, so well, well, whilst we wait to see what Ross and Colin say, can I, can I ask one final question from me, I promise. If you had three top tips to give people, quite a few delegates have said that they hope their areas will get this, but what three tips would you give to folk going down this path? Sue is looking very pointedly <laughs> at Andy here expecting him to answer. I would say, remember, remember from the bottom up, find a yes. clinical team to work with. Do, do, do that first if you can. If you've got a, a key pathway or a key user base that are crying out for that, get them on board and let them drive it with you. Um, I would say, 
you will need plenty of money um, and you will need more money than you think and you will need money to get through incidentals there will be lots of issues within your partners where they'll need funding that they may not necessarily have or prepared for so if you can get a war chest that's really really helpful um, and get the execs on board yeah yeah brilliant okay can i just ask you to answer colin's question then are you linking this to the acs digital work streams and then when we've done that we will um, round it up yes yes we are yeah, it's, it is part of our, our local ACS digital yeah. work stream. It's one of the things into consideration. Okay, are we going to run out? I, I just said we finished, but Patricia just nipped in with a question. Um, have you had similar issues to Patricia about um, his DARS application linking with adult social care? There has been that issue in DARS, because it's not been directly as part of this program. We have another another um, information system in Doncaster um, that where they have specifically linked adult social care with SUS data for pathway analysis. Um, a colleague in Doncaster from the information department could help uh, Pratesh with that question. If you want to drop me a line, Pratesh, at my email address, I'm happy to put you in contact with the people that have dealt with that. Okay. Um, well, that's fabulous. Um, Andy, too, thank you very much for that. That's generated a lot of positive comment and lots of engagement. Um, You'll see on screen now a, um, an evaluation form. There's always an evaluation form. Um, so if you could let us know um, how that's been. Um, and yes, yeah, th thank you for your attention. As I say, um, a further webinar on integrated workforces at 12 o'clock on Thursday, and then on metrics and evaluation at 12 o'clock on the 27th of June. So do sign up for those at Sky's website. Um, um, and in the meantime, have a very lovely afternoon. Thank you.